We're in the studio of Julia Schwadron Marianelli today, and um, I wanted to ask her a few questions, starting with, where did you grow up? Um, so I uh, grew up mostly, since I was five, um, I grew up in, in LA, West LA area. My folks are from Rhode Island, and we moved from Rhode Island to LA. Uh, my dad was a newspaper editor at the LA Times, and so we moved there for his job and to be near my grandparents who were his parents um, and they were also living in LA. And um, then when I was in college, uh, they moved back to New York and my dad worked for the New York Times for another 20 years. And so uh, I've lived kind of half my life in New York and half my life in LA. Okay, and when did you move to Tahoe? And then I moved to Tahoe uh, 10 years ago, almost exactly, yeah. Wow. Okay. And how do you find that your practice has actually altered now that you live like in the high altitude forest at Lake Tahoe? <laughs> yes. Everything is altered. Um, my whole life is like as different as you can imagine uh, from what it was before. Um, my practice, uh, the things I think about have completely been altered by this environment. Um, I never really looked to the landscape at all. Uh, for my work and so that that's the hugest shift is just not only in terms of subject matter but in terms of the way I'm painting, the way I'm collecting influences for paintings, um, the color that's in the work, the layering that's in the work is all a result of um, just being here in this space. And how often are you able to get into your studio to actually work it actually work because well, I know that you've got a lot of other things going on I've got a lot of things going on um, my studio is in my home so that's one way that I've shortened the commute to get into the studio um, my kind of golden hour is um, first thing in the morning so if my my most of my strategy is just waking up before anyone else and getting into the studio for at least an hour in the morning and then hopefully more as the day goes on but I just I just make sure that I get in here first thing Okay, and so do you have some sort of process that you go through beforehand, like to get yourself ready, or no. do you have a s <laughs> certain type of music? I have or... no process. Um, basically, I, just, I listen to one million different podcasts, and um, it used to be in the old days of grad school, I would just have NPR on all the time, ad nauseum, and I think podcasts have just replaced, just like I really love to hear people's stories, and so... I listen to, I follow several different podcasts and kind of just listen to whatever I'm feeling in the moment. And usually I have several projects or paintings that are in, in process. And so I just try to get involved in one of those things right away. Okay. And what are those podcasts that you're listening oh to at God. the moment? Well, they're very, they vary in subject matter from like, you know, just the classic true crime genre to more like cultural, political podcasts to um, storytelling podcasts, but there's so many I don't even know. I couldn't even name them. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so Julia, you have two young, very, very active children. How do you juggle your family responsibilities and your art practice? Well, it's not easy, but um, I basically do my best to um, try to like, uh, you know, get up and work first thing in the morning before they wake up um, for at least an hour and then um, get things sort of moving in the studio so that after they get off to school, I can get back in here without too much of a transition. Um, but, you know, it's, there's, like you said, they're very active. So, like, once they're home from school, it's kind of over uh, for me because they've got sports, they've got um, other responsibilities. And, you know, I, it's important to me that we have family time in the evening and so and I'm actually better in the morning just attention wise and productivity wise so it's it kind of works out right now the ages that they are that you know we kind of I have my time in the earlier part of the day and then I'm dedicated to them in the later part of the day are they showing any interest in artwork themselves oh or? yeah I mean they always they always have made things with me in the studio um, they've always you know, will talk to me about whatever I'm doing or walking in in the middle of whatever I'm doing. And so I think they're very comfortable with um, just like knowing that mom's an artist and she's working on this thing or don't touch this because it's not, you know, it's her, it's her work. And, you know, well, they'll ask me, they have their own um, boxes of supplies in here and they'll just come in and ask me and then they, they often will work alongside me.
Yeah, that's great. Um, can you talk about time management? Because I, mean, I know that you're a teacher as well, yeah. and you used to run the master's program at Sierra Nevada University. Mm -hmm. um, I think that time management is going to be something that a lot of people would be really interested to know how. Yes, I mean, I wish I had a formula, but I think, you know, I'm definitely uh, sensitive to, um, you know, kind of people and forces outside of yourself needing your attention at a lot of time out of your day. And so I guess I just try and do my best to ask, you know, is this a really important thing that I need to attend to? Is this a really important phone call I need to have? Or is this like something I can do on the weekend? You know, I, I guess for me, the weekends are typically days that I'm not working in the studio. And so that's when I try to like, you know, see friends, hang out, go do stuff outside with my family. And, um, but as far as, as, as um, time management, I don't know that I've really mastered it. I think you just have to do your best to prioritize kind of, especially if you have a deadline coming up or, you know, work that needs to be delivered for a certain purpose. Do you make lists or? Oh yeah, have... I make lots of lists. The post-it note strategy I lists, or? I have lists everywhere, <laughs> in my phone, on my desk, and you know, yeah, I write everything down. The calendars, we have a family calendar, it's very helpful, so I know when other people are in different places. Um, but yeah, list making and kind of getting my head around the day right from the beginning is, is key. But again, I'm often late. Uh, I'm often packing too many things into one day. Um, I have big, my eyes are bigger than my stomach. Um, so I run into that problem constantly. Julia, how does the natural environment actually influence you and your work? How do you, how would you talk about that? I would say it's primary uh, for my current practice. Um, I, before I moved to Tahoe, I really didn't look at the landscape at all as part of um, an influence on my work. I really thought about like my internal landscape, the landscape of my mind, uh, text, words, thoughts, kinds of, you know, issues in the painting. Um, and then when I moved to Tahoe, I started eventually finding my way out to the trails as a trail runner and really interacting with the landscape one-on-one -on -one in that way and collecting, um, collecting things to paint, literally dragging them into my studio, using them as still life objects or just taking photos and collecting um, all kinds of detritus on the forest floor, on the trail, um, and using that as part of a layering strategy to talk about both external landscape and internal landscape kind of intermingling. So I'd say, yeah, it's hugely important. Okay, and then how does this um, painting behind you, how does this fit into the So this is a this series. Is, this is, is a it part of a series? Um, I don't know. I think this painting is an extension of something that I was working on prior. Um, a, a, client of mine asked me to make this painting based on a previous work that they were interested in and they just really wanted a larger scale painting and so um, it's basing it's an iteration of, of an idea that I had been working with after um, I was in New York upstate New York for an artist residency a few summers ago it was very very rainy I was walking through like lots of muddy forest floor and a friends of mine had pointed me towards these jack-o'-lantern mushrooms and they are um, I guess notorious for the fact that they're often mistaken um, for, a, for a chanterelle mushroom which people eat but these are poisonous if you eat them and so I, was, I loved that idea of um, something beautiful that's also something deadly um, and that's so much of what nature is for us more and more um, and so anyway, this painting was made um, as an homage to those mushrooms and it's called The Rain's Promise. Uh, and the, the people really came to see this love, the painting, but they, were, but they again, they, they, they wanted something larger scale. So we worked together to create a collage of um, both the original imagery that I used for the generation of this painting and then additional um, source material that featured the same type of forest growth and mushroom growth um, created this um, version of a painting just for them. Um, similar surface, similar materials.
So Julia, you use text in um, a lot of your work. This piece behind you, I can see that there is some, some text in there. Um, what's the thought or process behind the partially obscured text? So I've been using text uh, in the last few, few years to be a starting point for the paintings. Um, kind of like this text is the representation of an internal uh, monologue, an internal landscape, and then coming together with an external landscape relationship. And so the way that the text becomes obscured um, or is transparent um, is sort of haphazard in terms of how the painting gets made. A painting like this is so large that I can't paint it on the wall. It's lying down like so I'm like physically on top of the painting the whole time so it's sometimes I'm I have to stop in the middle and like hang it up and get perspective on what the actual thing looks like because I you know I'm going back and forth so it's really physical um, but the, the text here says trembling grass vibrating grass and most of the ways I come up with the text for paintings that either becomes usually become the title of the painting but are definitely the structural beginning of um, the architecture of the image is just kind of thinking about relationships between characteristics of human beings and characteristics of what I observe in nature or natural things like grass might be trembling as a way to describe the movement of grass but the term trembling when you think about it in relation to us in, implies much more of an emotional state and I love thinking about this back and forth between what we might learn from being more like plants caring less, having less moral righteousness, um, and just kind of dealing with um, the world uh, in, a, in a more neutral way. But again, that's just my human projection onto to grass. I, I've never actually had a real conversation with grass, though I try. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I like how the, the text kind of makes this, I think gives like a certain layer of vibrancy to the image on top. And, and I like this kind of, I'm experimenting with the tension of how much text remains and how much gets obscured. Julia, what are you using to paint with? Um, I'm using acrylic ink and um, it's kind of in between a watercolor and an, a, a traditional acrylic paint. So it's, you know, not heavy bodied, it's more liquid. It's, you know, basically it's, it's very liquidy, if you can hear it. Um, but you can water it down quite a bit before it loses its its um, saturation power and so that was one of the things I really liked about it when I started using it was that I could kind of water it down and use it for layering um, but still get a lot of power out of the color um, and you can also you know mix it in with more uh, white or colors that have white in them and then you can get very detailed and opaque with those details and use small brushes or big brushes and depending on the kind of surface it's um, really nice because it will saturate but it also once you build up enough layers it will stand up on top of itself like a regular acrylic paint might um, and I like I said I work in my house so it's important that I'm not um, doing things that are super toxic in here although I do often still work in oil paint and, um, but uh, not as often as I used to does it have any relation to gouache at all? You know, I'm not a super expert on gouache, uh, but I know that traditionally gouache was something kind of in between an acrylic and a and a watercolor. But I don't know what gouache's like stretch stretch power is, and that's just my lack of experience with gouache. And I think the the liquidy aspect of the ink is something I really like because I often will start you know, with a surface and just kind of saturate it with color to get to get going and then slowly build up layers in that way. So there's a sort of elasticity to these inks? Yeah, they're light fast. They're, they're like I said, it depends on the color, but there are certain colors that are super saturated um, and really powerful kind of poppy color, which I like. Julia, where can we see your work at the moment? Uh, at the moment, I'm in a three-woman show in Truckee called Field Notes that you curated. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. <laughs> with Megan Berner and um, Jean Brennan, who are um, both amazing artists who also are influenced highly by the environment that they're working in. 
Um, and so a lot of the work, I mean, I have probably 25 paintings in that show. It's quite, it's quite a big space and they range from work I did like 2018 to the present. So there's lots of bodies of work in there are several bodies of work, but I'd say that thread through is the reference to the environment, the reference to the natural environment and aspects of that in the work. Um, there's a few paintings that I made, uh, couple summers ago that were featured in a show um, that was titled Trembling Grass, Vibrating Grass, and that all that work was a, was really f centered around this idea of trying to have a conversation with the natural world, literally. Um, so some of them have words in embedded in the paintings, and some of them are actual like plant life embedded in the fabric and then painted on top. So there's lots of different strategies I used to try to, to attempt to converse. Um, there's this is this painting here is called Spike Kiss and it's related to the work that is currently in the Field Notes exhibition. You can see a little bit of the text popping through there, um, but I begin all of these paintings on panel by, you know, kind of embedding the title of the painting into the, well, not kind of embedding the title of the painting into the painting as the first layer. So it basically says Spike Kiss over and over, and then I start layering. Um, the flora and fauna on top. Um, sometimes it gets a little out of control and you can't read anything anymore, but you, you do have this idea that if you look further into the painting that you're going to get more information and that there is something to find. And so that's something I'm, that's a tension I'm trying to cultivate in the work. One of the viewers at the show actually asked me what the secret messages were. So, <laughs> so it's working. So it is um, working. But yeah. um, the, um, yeah. I was wondering, how do you come up with the title before you come up with the painting? It's all kind of in my mind at the same time, but usually I'm outside and I'm thinking about qualities that are either human qualities that we would assume human humans feel that are then that I'm projecting onto the plants or vice versa. Like I think in this case of spike kiss, I was, there's just so many plants that are very spiky and um, they just start grabbing things all the time, which is like a survival mechanism to fertilize themselves. So they're like aggressive. There's just a lot of like, when you think of being spiked, it's not like a, it's not a gentle experience, but when you think about spiking in the attempt to reproduce, it's just kind of a funny, a funny thought. So I just thought about like, if you're, trying to kiss something that's spiky or, you know, it's this kind of soup that I get into of my head of, of trying not to be super literal, but trying to uh, come up with language that would create that tension that I'm looking for in the work. And then the images are often just collected over many, many, many trail runs. And uh, I just, both look at color and quality of what I'm, what I've photographed, and think about the best reference that would match the text. Excuse me, poking around in your studio, yeah, I'm just spiking around. Toes. <laughs> <laughs> How do you get out of a rut if you're just in that situation where you're just drawing a blank on what you want to paint? Yeah, I would say, as a rule, it used to happen a lot more often when I was younger freer now that i'm uh mature i i just know more about i have more preciousness um and val like feeling kind of constantly feeling the value of, of the time i have to be in the studio so it's almost like my brain short circuits those doubts and i just kind of start working immediately because i don't i consciously i, I just always thinking about um there's not enough time there's not enough time. Who's that rabbit that runs around with the clock? You know, oh, I, yes, exactly. I rabbit. feel like the rabbit where I'm like, <laughs> at all times I have to be producing something that's going to get me to the next place. And that doesn't mean that everything I make ends up being any good, but I think I have a, just a habitual continuing to turn over every rock until I figure out where there's a productive place to put my energy in the studio. And then trying to keep multiple projects going at once is another way. It's just like something's kind of running into a wall, then you turn and you work on the next thing. Um, multiple different kinds of materials, different kinds of surfaces. Um, but yeah, it's 
it's less of a rat filled practice than it used to be, <laughs> put it that way. And I think that's really good advice because um, a lot of people think that, you know, artists have to wait around for the inspiration, but you actually have to just push through. No time to wait. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then the final question is, if you have any advice for, say, a painter or an artist mm -hmm. that wants wants to be in their studio producing 100% of the time, what would your advice to them be? Um, honestly, I don't think that that exists. Um, maybe it's a very small percentage of artists who just, just produce work and that's all they do. Um, but I do think that it really depends on the region you're working in, the contacts you have in that region, and the outlets you have to put your work into the world. Um, it depends how willing you are to diversify your product if you want to put it that way, the, the different ways you market your work, the different ways you show folks your work, um, the different um, levels of access to your work. Um, but yeah, I think for me, living in a small town in the mountains, it's really about just sharing with people here, sharing with people outside of here, trying to work with galleries, trying to work with um, folks in nonprofit spaces who can get your work just to be seen and then to try to cultivate as many conversations, collaborations as possible. And um, the more you put out there, the more busy you become. Um, but I certainly don't just make my living from painting. I mean, I also teach, I'm doing freelance projects, and I think it's it's a scramble for sure. And um, unfortunately, I think our, our, our country doesn't really respect artists <laughs> to the extent that they respect other creative um, enterprises and so you, you really have to be unfortunately I'm gonna use the word creative to figure out how you can survive and um, it's definitely not fair and it's definitely not easy but um, there are just depends on, on all the ways that you can diversify your skill set okay and that's really good advice um, Julia thank you so much for allowing us to snoop around in your studio and thank, thank you for sure. talking to everyone Please head off to Field Notes and have a look at Julia's work. She has a huge body of work there. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I just want to thank you again. Well, my, my pleasure. Thank you so much.